Um, just to go through a few things before we start. So again, welcome to another Welsh Athletics webinar. As so Steve reminded me, these are going to be gone for three months now. So I very much appreciate you guys uh, sort of staying involved. Um, so I'm Liz. Um, I've been supporting the kind of webinar engagement uh, for endurance during the lockdown. Um, so yeah, thanks, thanks for tuning in. A few housekeeping rules um, before we start. So you're all on mute, so don't worry about that. Um, you, any issues around technical side of things, just pop them in the chat. Um, and any questions um, for Steve, which we'll do at the end of the, of the webinar, pop them in the questions box. Um, so for those of you who don't know Steve, um, which I'm sure most of you do, tuning in this evening, um, Steve is um, the head coach at Team New Ballot, so coaches a, a range of uh, elite athletes. Um, Steve's also been quite an accomplished athlete himself, both on the fells and also on cross country. And I'm sure he'll tell you a little bit more about that in his webinar. Um, so yeah, brings a lot of experience to the table tonight and personal um, insights into mountain running. So without further ado, I will hand you over to Steve Vernon. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Liz. And thank you everyone for joining this evening. Like Liz said, I know a lot of people that maybe webinared out at this point in time I, I didn't think we'd be still having as many webinars you know in in july when we kicked all this off in in march but i found them really useful myself i've been on a number of them from welsh athletics england athletics and uh, northern ireland athletics so I, I hope you get a lot of benefit from this as well tonight so um i'm uh, very lucky to be in sunny switzerland well there was a thunderstorm earlier so it's not quite as good so it's very apt that i'm talking about the mountains while being in the mountains an altitude camp with some of my group. So um, before we uh, sort of kick off with the specifics of mountain running, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about myself. Um, for those that you don't know me, like Liz mentioned, I was an international cross country and mountain runner uh, for, for many years. I was lucky enough to have a good junior career and then go right through to 33, 34 years of age when I decided to to focus on my coaching, um, which was 2013-14, where I really thought that uh, I wanted to put more into my coaching than I did my own athletics career. But I've been coaching properly um, since 2010, where um, my first couple of athletes, um, well, my first athlete was actually Ross Millington, who was a, a 2016 Olympian in the 10,000 metres. Um, and then my second athlete actually was Welshman Andy Davies, who most of you will know well. Um, but really for me, I've always been a student of the sport, always love reading about as much as I can. I mean, my, my shelves at home are full of autobiographies, biographies and running books. And, and I did that from a very early age um, in, my, in my running career. I started getting those books when I was 19, 20. And, and so I really knew that coaching or an interest within the sport was something I wanted to do. Um, I did the usual route um, for, for anyone that was lucky enough to get sort of sports scholarships. I went to Loughborough, did sports science um, and physiology, and um, I've done a, a master's degree in uh, health, nutrition and physical activity. So all my um, sort of education is around, around sport and the sciences surrounding sport. So um, yeah, now I'm, I'm well into my coaching career. I'm 39 now. I'm coaching 12 international uh, athletes from road track cross country and mountain so across the board and that's distances from 800 meters right up into the marathon um, and the ultra distance on the mountains with Andy Davies and um, I'm lucky enough now for it to be my job I work for New Balance and uh, I run the professional team which is Team New Balance Manchester and we have athletes from from all over Europe and um, we've got Swedish, Swiss, Irish, Dutch, Welsh, English, Scottish, um, I'm probably missing someone out there, but we, yeah, we're right across Europe now with Team New Balance Manchester. Um, and that is um, based just south of Manchester on the edge of the Peak District. And we have an athlete house there, which five of the international athletes live in. Um, and it's, yeah, so far it's going, going really well. We've got a few already qualified for um, the Olympics, hopefully in Tokyo next year. So mountain running. The facts, and I wanted to start with some facts for everyone to get a real picture of, of what is required now within the sport of mountain running. And, and this obviously also includes the fells that we, we know here in the UK, but mountain running really has moved on. I know when I got my first vest in uh, GB vest in 2005, and I went to the Europeans and finished ninth, and 
of course I was uh, I was fit I trained for it but when I look at what I did then to finish ninth I wouldn't finish in the top 30 with with the same sort of performance now on the uh, the European level and I think there was when I first went to mountain running I got a, a, a few people saying to me that it was an easy vest and it certainly is, isn't easy a vest anymore it really isn't and the mountain running is IWF recognized and the the top guys and girls in the world are accomplished athletes not just on the mountains but also on the road and track and that's why i wanted to also say that for mountain running flat speed is relevant and um, you can't get away with being just um a mountain runner and not having some sort of pedigree on the flat or, or doing sessions that, that give you the leg speed mountain runners are long distance runners so they're not just mountain runners a long distance runner is, is obviously all the longer distances from sort of 3,000 meters upwards and that's what a mountain runner is it's in that group of long distance runners and used to be just put in this oh he or she is just a fell runner or just a mountain runner that's certainly not the case anymore training if you want to be successful has to be specific has to be um you've got to train for the mountains and, and that's something i certainly learned in my career as a mountain runner and i'll go into more detail with shortly and the preparation and planning is key. You have to prepare and plan for it and not just have a go at it willy nilly and hope you'll do well. And I'll also delve deeply into the sort of preparation and planning that's required. So just to back up some of those facts, um, the last couple of years here, the uh, World Mountain Marine Championships, the 2019, the up and down race, the winner, Joe Gray from the USA, he's a 28, 18, 10,000 meter runner. Um, the uh, second place there, the Italian, 64-48 half marathon, and then the Czech athlete. Um, you know, I, I dug deeply into whether they ever run track and road before, and, and there's an 8-14-3000. So all of them, yes, they're not necessarily world, world-class times, but all very respectable international times on the flat. Then if you look at the females of the European mountain room, which is the uphill only, you've got Maud Matisse there from Switzerland. She's run 33.03 uh, for 10K on the road. Andrea Mayer, 230.43 for the marathon. And she is also um, an accomplished steeplechaser. She's been to the Olympics in the steeplechase. And then Christelle Dewal, who is, is a mountain specialist, and I can't find track and road times four, but just that gives you a real example that the, the level that these pe people are at not only the world-class mountain runners, but they're international road and track runners too. So if you um, look at the, the actual international um, mountain running uh, guide and the, the WRMA and, and MRA and also the IWF, the actual categories for the European and World Mountain Running Championships and also the trials for them, um, they look a bit like this. So for the mainly uphill, you're looking at 1200 meters ascent in 12k and you can see as it goes down so we're looking at 10 percent climb over the, the, uh, the whole distance and that's as an average so it gets steeper and also less and then the up and down races as you can see in a 12k distance which is normally on laps you're looking at you know a, a 600 meter and 750. so even at the the junior level if you go down there we're still talking about even in a 5k distance 500 meters of climb is, is 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 massive and that's something that you don't easily get 500 meters of climb at your at your local hill down the road unless you live deep in the hearts of snowdonia or up in the lake district so the event is when you look at the detail and the specifics it's tough and what you're asking your body to do is um going to require specific preparation so the physical requirements of, of mountain running, um, it's, as you all know, it's demanding, it hurts. And most people, when you tell them you're a mountain runner, think you're stupid, but it does require a certain mental toughness, but also a, a real physical strength is required to be a good mountain runner. So I put across the top there, quad, glute, and calf strength are key when running uphill. Um, and if you're weak in those areas, you're certainly going to get found out on the mountains. So one of the things that um, if they're not strong enough and you want to be a mountain runner, it's certainly something that you need to be working at um, either within your running training or also within the gym. 
mountain running, fell running is all off-road and predominantly on uneven and, and dirt trails. So proprioception is key. And if your proprioception um, isn't good, then you're going to lose energy and you're going to lose a lot of energy trying to stabilize yourself. So proprioception on the ground and on an uneven ground is essential. Running economy, so how you utilize energy at a sort of aerobic pace. So running economy is a, a measurement that's used in, in laboratories, but it's something that is um, looked at across all um, endurance running events. And it, running economy is, is something that is required uh, to be successful, but especially in mountain running. High maximal aerobic capacity. So for most people know that as VO2 max, it's not essential and um, we know that there's people that are very successful in sport that don't have a massive uh, vo2 max but they're able to work at a high percentage of their two vo2 max and um, so it isn't um absolutely essential but it's a beneficial if you do have a high vo2 max lactate threshold is something that we we all know about with regards to, to tempo running um but in terms of lactate threshold and lactate turn point the higher end it has to be relative to mountain running because it's very different and there's not many um, studies or scientific studies to test lactate threshold of mountain running because the speeds are, are so slow relative to heart rate and it's very hard to get consistent steep hills um, and, and test that unless you're on a treadmill that can, that can go very steep. So there's not much data out there, but I think we all know that if you've got a, a high uh, lactate threshold relative to going uphill, then it, you're going to be, it's going to help you and you're going to be successful. And then ankle stability, of course, goes um, coincides with proprioception, but it's something that all fell and mountain runners should be working on because not only is it important for landing well and being stable on the ground, ground which adds to better running economy, but also we know that with descending and especially in the fells, if you haven't got strong ankles, and you, you, you could, you're at risk of breaking your ankle or damaging your ankle over time. So one thing that really needs to be worked out for mountain running. So while we've got sort of the requirements of the event, what is required in terms of the actual mountain or the hills that you're running up, and then also what's required physically, then what type of training can we be doing that to improve those areas? So I'm um, a famous Welshman on the right there, but in an English vest, but that's my fault. I'm a Stockport Harrier. So he, as well as being Malwin, he joined Stockport, but that's Andy Davis there after finishing second in the Jungfrau uh, Mountain Marathon, which is, if, if any of you know about that race, it's absolutely brutal where it's um, half marathon on the road or well, just over actually it's 25K on the road, relatively flat, some small climbs, and then you you climb um, up to the, uh, the basically uh, the bottom uh, cable car station of the Jungfrau Marathon. So up over uh, 2000 meters and you do that all, you basically climb Snowden twice in the, in the last uh, sort of 15K, 17K, it's, it really is tough. But um, I think one of the things is, and the reason I put Andy here as the, the picture is, when you're training, mountain miles versus road miles are, are very different. When Andy's training for a marathon, we're hitting around 95, to 100 miles a week. When Andy's training um, for a mountain type uh, long distance race, obviously when you're up in the mountains and you know some of the mi miles can be as slow as 19 minute miles because it's that steep. When I'm planning training and looking at training, you're gonna run those sort of mileage in the mountains. You've got to factor that a lot of it is gonna be much slower. So a 10 mile run in the mountains, you know, is a very, very different, even if it's an easy run to a 10 mile run on the roads. So that certainly needs to be factored when planning overall mileage. As well as that, you need to factor in recovery, um, especially with the, the downhill type races and downhill sessions, because they do take a, there's a lot of muscle damage occurs there and um, recovery may take longer than normal. And when we're training specifically for, for mountain races, Andy will only do two hard sessions in a week or two specific sessions to mountain uh, running. Also races and the recovery between races, it's not something where you can race every single week and um, recovery has to be in there to, so when, um, you know, training or racing, it really needs to be, um, you know, looking at the uh, factoring recovery overall. 
Supplementary training, something that is used, um, you know, by myself and my athletes, but also some of the world's best mountain marine uh, athletes is, is using the bike. And that can be stationary bike or it can be mountain biking and actually climbing on the bike just to give the le legs um, a chance and the feet a chance after a tough racing training. But you get a lot of glute and uh, quad strength from that. So I've seen some really successful mountain runners that incorporate a lot of biking into their training especially if they're, they're injury prone um, in other ways. So, you know, like I've mentioned, it has to be specific. And unless you're living in Scotland or in Snowdonia and the Lake District, to find really, really long mountain climbs is, is challenging and difficult. And that's why some of the best mountain runners in the world do base themselves in, in Europe, where a lot of the races are. Now, for uphill only, it's obviously the main challenge for long, long enough climbs. And so, I live in Manchester, not the hilliest place, but I, I do have the Peak District on my doorstep. But a lot of the time I use the treadmill for the longer uphill tempo runs and intervals and it might be boring, um, but it's a really good way to replicate, especially when you can put the percentage of the climb that you, you, you're aiming for. And as we've seen with the World Mountain Marine races, 10% is, is an average there and you can easily program that in on a treadmill. Uh, crazy as it sounds, Long hill reps, I've seen world-class athletes and I've done it myself in, in literally finding the longest hill you can get and to minimize recovery, have somebody drive you back down. And I've got a great eight minute hill rep not far from me where I used to be driven down in, uh, I think the record was two minutes, 11 seconds back down, which was probably speeding, but I was getting short recoveries doing eight minute hill reps. So uh, going back to the leg strength, specific leg strength in the gym and strengthening of the glutes and the quads and calves can be done to really uh, heavy loading in the gym and really helps with injury, injury prevention as well. So something I incorporated and incorporate with my athletes. For the up and down races, and we all know that if you're not prepared and you go and do a, your first fell race of the season, the doms and the, the, uh, the pain in the quads can be horrific. And there's the eccentric conditioning for descending is a very important thing and especially to, um, you know, limit the risk of injury to knees, etc. So a lot of um, the early phases of if there's up and down races is just making sure that if you are doing hill reps, you, you can start with shorter ones and run back down that, the hill um, fairly fast. But on, if it only starts up at 30 seconds and then build that to a minute over time, et cetera, to, uh, to minimize injury. So eccentric conditioning, especially for the, um, the downhill races is really, really important. And then once again, proprioception training. And I believe that all athletes, whether the mountain runners or not, should be good at, at balancing and, and being strong on, on the ground. And I think, um, you know, the sport of running, yes, it's two legs, but you've only got one foot on the ground at one time. And, you know, some of the, the best in the world, I remember Paula Radcliffe uh, mentioning to me because I'd had some injuries and, and saying to me about my feet. And she literally used, um, I mean, I wouldn't try this at home, but, you know, even using a wobble board and then distracting yourself, like brushing your teeth or, or doing the washing up. But just simply standing on one leg at home or on a cushion or something, getting somebody to throw you a tennis ball or um, using therabands around your feet. They're really good for, for helping with proprioception and, and, and strengthening up your feet on the ground. So that leads me on now to, to preparation. And I think I put a quote in here that I really, really, really like. And um, one important key to success is self-confidence. An important key to self-confidence is preparation. And I think one of the things that I realized um, with my coach, who didn't have an experience in mountain running at the time, is that I was not prepared. And also that led me to being not confident, especially when going to, to races in Europe. So I decided after having, um, you know, starting my mountain career in 2005 and having mixed results, still making teams and running well, but not being at the level that I thought I could be. And that was challenging for medals. And, and trying to get in the, uh, in the European champs and trying to make that top 10 in the world championships. And I really believe that I was on that level. So I think I had to take mountain running a lot more seriously. Um, I was a successful international cross country runner and I had um, problems on the track, injury problems, had a lot of allergies in the summer where track running just, I wasn't successful at and I, I decided to focus on my mountain running. So I, I sat down with my coach and, and thought to myself, well, 
how are we going to improve? And we look back at previous seasons where why had one race gone well and some others, and we came up with a sort of plan and what do I need to change? And most of that was being more specific in my preparation. When are the trials and championships and working back from that, not just finding mountain races willy nilly and then hoping at the end of the season, I'd be able to compete at the major championship, working back and choosing the right races. When will the training take place and the different phases, not just in the week, but in the months and then an annual plan. So I really did sort of look back and, and think to myself, right, I, I, I need to look at when I'm going to peak for, what training I'm going to do along the, or, and along the way, and why am I doing the certain training? What is required to run uphill for 12K, uh, an average gradient of 10%. So that leads on to the course specifics, the profiles of the course. Some courses um, are a lot steeper than others. Some are, have quite, um, you know, flat sections within a race where as a faster athlete, a good cross country, I, I could potentially make time up. But then some of the parts of the courses that might be 20% gradient even, you know, are really steep sections. How am I going to prepare for that? And what does that require? Going to major championships as well, sometimes that's a factor in temperature especially uh, I had a race in Turkey where it was 34 degrees. I had, you know, I could do all the preparation I want in the UK, but then if I turn up uh, to Turkey and it's 34 degrees, I'm, I'm just going to fry out there. And then also altitude. Most of the European races and the mountain races out there, they finish at a higher high altitude and anything over 1500 meters or roughly 5,000 feet is classed as high altitude and it's going to be detrimental to performance if you're not prepared for it. So I had to really think to myself, am I willing to put in the preparation to be successful or am I happy just being a good mountain runner and, and making these teams? So we, we came up with a plan and, and I really looked at the altitude considerations. I couldn't, at the time I was working, I couldn't afford to go on altitude training camps. Um, and that led me into using altitude chambers, which I'll talk about shortly. But also fueling, do I need to fuel? And some of the, the mountain races, I felt that um, fueling was important to me. So that was something else I needed to practice. And then testing, is, is there any lab testing? Was there any testing that I could potentially do to, to see if I'm improving? How, how do I know if I'm improving at the mountain running? How do I know if I'm becoming more efficient? And that's something I worked with British Athletics with. Um, the physiologist at the time, Barry Fudge, help me with some uh, physiological testing that was more relatable to mountain running. So I wanted to give you an example and, and really show you now of how I did it, how I became from a good mountain runner to what I classed as, as reaching my potential as a mountain runner. So this was 2012-13, and um, it feels like yesterday to me, but it's quite a, a long time ago now. But um, that year I had my, uh, I had the Europeans up and down was 2012, whereas 11th, and that was in Turkey. And I, and I think that was my, I was pleased with that performance. I wasn't the best up and down runner. And to, to finish 11th in extremely hot temperatures, I was really pleased with. But I knew that next year I was stronger European, a stronger uphill only runner. And I knew that the next year I had a real chance on the uphill only. If I could finish 11th at the up and down, I thought I could maybe get a medal at the uphill only. So the year looked like this. Um, from 2012, the autumn, my general October to March was always training to increase lactate threshold, tempo type running, tempo intervals. Um, some of them it sort of guided towards more of a, a marathon pace and then sometimes more of the lactate threshold, um, uh, the, sorry, the lactate turn point speed, which is more relatable to, to 10K half marathon speed. And so I did a lot of training around that area to improve my lactate threshold and also race well on the road and cross country. And that was a priority for me. Now that year, I actually finished 10th in the European cross countries in the December of 2012, which my, was my best finish there. And also as we rolled over into 2013, I was second in, in the English National Cross Country Championship, which I you know, knew that if I can get a medal there, that I was usually on the, on the right track. And then my plan then was from April after the cross country season, after a small break through to June, I was going to really work on specific mountain preparation with an occasional road race just to keep feeling fast and keep the turnover there for, for that mountain running. Because I knew that some of the courses 
um, were going to have some faster sections in it and I still needed to be able to cope with a fairly fast start um, and if you've been to some of the international mountain races you'd be shocked at how fast people go off. That did result in um, a fifth which I look back at now and think was brilliant uh, but at the time I thought it was failure because I really wanted a medal. But that was the rough overview and now I can give you an insight into how it actually looked. So like I said that phase one was increasing the mileage the October to March and building aerobic capacity. I did regular short hills though still and the reason I put short in in sort of uh, speech marks there was really because short hills relative to mountain running and um, so I was doing a lot of sort of one minute 90 second and two minute hill reps in that autumn and still included those tempo runs. The second phase before the sort of European cross and then the Jan February races was you know the distances across country races for senior men is 10k so I did a lot of 10k specific pace work track or road and then occasionally VO2 max intervals, which was 3K, 5K, but not a lot of that. At that time of year, the relevance of doing that um, and the, how much those type of sessions take out of you, I did just occasionally or maybe part of a session had some VO2 max intervals. And then weekly tempo runs. Every single week, there was an element of tempo running in there. And I can show you shortly how that how I would structure a week. But Tempo runs were a massive part of what I was doing in it, and I, I realized the benefits of putting them in weekly. And like I said, that third phase was the racing of the cross country. And, that, and it was uh, that season really was the European cross December, then through to the end of February, early March, English national championships. And there were my two priorities. So once I had that break at the end of the cross country season, the first phase then was to increase base mileage again. And for me, that was building it up to around 90 miles a week. Increase the long run, get the long run back up to what I would work up to uh, two hours in the hills and then start to introduce long hill reps again. And at the beginning, this was just two to four minute reps. Um, and usually I would do sort of six to eight of these. The second phase, I would once I got used to the, being back on the hills and, and my legs were conditioned, I'd increase the long rep duration, which was four to 10 minutes. And this was either on the treadmill or, as I said before, crazy being asking family members, girlfriends, whoever would, would, would help me drive me back down a, an enormously steep hill in the Peak District. And then race simulation. I knew that this, the racing uh, 2013 was going to be in Borovets in Bulgaria and we're going up to an altitude of 2,400 meters. So 8,000 feet and I knew that I had to prepare and I actually um, it was Sarah Rowell that really helped me with this um, um, who was the uh, the leader of the British mountain running team at the time and she got me into a lab at Crew and Alsages so I was driving an hour an hour and a half twice a week for six weeks before the championship to do a treadmill session at high altitude and um, it was uh, a tough experience the first couple of sessions I had to go really really easy but by the end I did feel that they were worthwhile and one of the things we did there we, we tested oxygen saturation and was very careful of how the sessions were and how long it took for my once I'd come out of the chamber for my oxygen saturation to get back to to a normal safe level so I could actually drive back to Stockport but um, that I think was key to me being successful at, at this this championship. And obviously the third phase there was the mountain racing season, which that year was fairly short one for me that included just a couple of races abroad and the British championships, which, which I won. So that gives you an insight into sort of how I did it. And I know that if I was a, a coach watching this webinar this evening, I love the takeaways and I love getting some session examples that yes, the, the relative to me, but also that you can take away and think that you could tweak these either for younger athletes or um, junior athletes or people that are trying to be successful and make um, you know, Welsh and GB teams. So if I just show you some of the um, things that I did there, and, and one of the things I, I will remind you that I still did some of the 3K, 5K work. I didn't just only do mountain run training. Once every two weeks, I would still do a track session with some 3K, 5K paced work within it. So uphill interval examples, there was obviously the, the five minute plus, which was uh, 
the Repsol pill with car recovery. But another one which was really good, but you do need a long, long, long hill is 10 by two minutes uphill. Um, and then I'd run back down to quite quickly, just one minute um, for, for recovery. And so if you think about that, running up for two, running back down fast for one, you're probably getting not far off the bottom of where you started. Um, but it does, you know, if you haven't got a really long hill, you won't be able to get, to, you, you do need a long hill to, to work the 10 by two minutes in. But that was the session that I did a lot. Um, and depending on how steep the hill would also depend on how quickly I ran back down. But that allowed me to compete continuous running and not have really long recoveries. And that was essential for being specific to mountain running. The treadmill sessions I've got here, these really are senior men examples for the, the longer distance, the, the 12K bit. Um, I did three by 10 minutes at 10% gradient. And then I had a one mile float as a recovery, but that one mile float, um, I still kept that at 5% gradient, dropped the pace and still, but still ran it a decent. The reason I put float there is it wasn't a jog. I was still putting the pace down to five five percent and still running at a six thirty mile pace at five percent gradient. Um, so you know it, it was a really tough session. And if you think about the total volume of the, the session there, I was nearly at you know over forty five minutes of, of uh, total running. Another one was eight by three minutes on the treadmill, and this was at ten percent gradient, slowly climbing up to fifteen percent gradient. But I used a sort of tempo heart rate to not allow me to overcook this and my heart rate I'd, I'd had done in a lab so I had that um, knowing where that limit was before I was going anaerobic and the recoveries there was a two minute recovery at slower speed so I'd slow it down and um, with one minute at that gradient and one minute at 0 percent so if that makes sense it's two minute recovery one minute still at whatever gradient I was running at and then I'd just drop it for one minute to the flat to just really recover and then go again the speeds of these sessions, and it might be a question that people might want to ask later, but it all depends on the individual. And also, I got it wrong a few times. So it was really important that I started off at a speed that was almost too easy on that first couple of reps to then know how much more faster I could go. And it usually meant that I started at a comfortable speed that was easy for 10% gradient. But by the time I got up to 15% gradient, it was quite tough. Okay, so the training week, here's how um, a training week would look for me. And this was uh, the exact example of what I was doing three weeks out. So I was about to begin my taper of uh, what's usually for a major championships was around about 10 days. Um, I was running um, twice, four days a week, as you can see, and doing a strength routine on a Wednesday and Saturday and a core session, just simple 15, 20 minutes of some physio exercises on a Monday and Sunday. But in there, plenty of easy running, which for me um, at the time was seven minute miling. And then um, kept, as you can see this week, it was 10 times 800 on the track at sort of my 10K um, pace. And that one would have been off a 90 second recovery, so jog 290. On a Friday there, I had long intervals, which were uh, five by five minute hill intervals. And then on Sunday, I would always do a, a long run with some long climbs, nice and easy, but as many sort of long climbs within a run as I could do without absolutely trashing my legs. So I'd usually manage sort of five climbs on a run like that that lasted around six or seven minutes. And then the rest of it, very easy running. Um, but as you can see, there was still plenty of strides in there as well to keep the leg turnover and plenty of just general aerobic easy running. But where I lived at the time, all my easy running was never completely flat. I had the option if I was tired to go on canal towpaths or disused railway lines, but most of it was just rolling hills. So I was always well conditioned to the mountains, but you can see that total week there at 93 miles. And that was around peak for me during the mountain running season. So I've given you examples of what I was um, doing back in 2012, 2013. Times have moved on um, and the athletes have moved on. Um, and so I wanted to give you examples of some of the best in the sport at the moment. Um, Jacob Atkin, a young Scottish athlete, has had a fantastic last couple of years on the mountains and became European champion last year in 2019 in Zermatt. 
again at high altitude and Jacob has spent a lot of his summers at high altitude to prepare properly. But his key sessions, he kindly shared them with me to, to give to you guys as um, he does a long uphill tempo, so just long climbs, but well within himself. It's still tough. A tempo run up uphill is still tough, but he does them between 30 and 45 minutes of climbing. The long reps there, um, four times six to eight minutes. And again, he would do that on a mountain where he'd have sort of a two to three minute jog recovery, but he would continue up the mountain and just slow the pace right, right down. And then um, you can see the other one there is three to five minutes hard uh, uh, uphill running as well. So there's different lengths of, of reps that he uses. And then, but Jacob also emphasized that he still keeps in touch with the power, pure power of hill sprints. So after an easy run, he'll do eight to 10 times 15 second hills. And that's a, something that he regularly puts in there in each week. But he did say to me, it's simple, really. You just have to get in the mountains and get conditioned for them. And I think that certainly is true. And, and Jacob really has become a specialist in the mountains because of that. But Jacob is, is really good at the up and down, but he's, he, he's had most success at the uphill only. Um, Marco De Gasperi, an Italian athlete, he's been a multiple European and, and world medalist over the years, um, a real superstar in Italy. And he was a, a, not only good at the uphill only, but also, you know, multiple uh, world champion at the up and down. He did some um, really interesting sessions. So one of them here is a far leg he used to do on a, on a 2K loop in the mountains, consisting of a flat section, a climb and a steep descent. And he'd do fartlicks of four times, three minutes, two minutes, and one minute hard. And then the recoveries would all be two minutes steady between each one and just continually run around this 2K, 2K loop, obviously with the steep, the up and the down. And then another one that he regularly did was um, a warm up, obviously, and then a climb of 800 meters. And that's not in length, that's in height. Um, and you do that in 43 minutes. So you can imagine, you know, it's a, a steep climb and then running relaxed. Um, you know, the climb wasn't flat out. So he'd run that nice and relaxed at an easy economical speed for him. But then you can see he's descended that 43 minute climb in 17 minutes. So he really has flown back down the mountain and that used to really condition himself for those, for those up and down uh, races. Total uh, one hour, 20 minute session. So um, some brutal, brutal, brutal sessions there, but obviously uh, resulted in becoming a multiple world champion. So as I'm, I'm sort of nearing the end here and making sure I've got plenty of time for questions, I wanted to sort of get across key messages for coaches and key messages that, that I feel are necessary. And from being a, a mountain running coach and, and learning from the likes of coaching Andy Davies for the long distance races, um, but also working on, on myself as a mountain runner, that flat speed was always relative to me. My best mountain races also came at a time when I was most successful on the cross country and able to, to compete and finish top 10 in Europe on the cross. And it is still relative to what you're doing. One of, one of the things that um, I've always made sure with the example of Andy Davies is that when he's been running you know ultra distance mountain races is that we've always want to still be in sub 15 minute 5k shape for Andy and and that's been really important that, that he's still got that in his in his legs. I think the focus if you really want to be successful in the mountains and the fells and um, there has to be some focus on it and yes it might only be six months of a season like I focused on cross and then I focused on mountains but it, it really has to be the focus. And if you're going to add in track or road, it just needs to be occasional and, and add value to the mountain running. I tried to balance the two one year and it does not work. Um, you just can't do the, the both sets of training. And physiologically, there's just too many different systems going on and you end up um, fatigued and, and often overtrained. So when you're sort of looking at um, a schedule um, or looking at some planning, where's the sort of track comparison with, with mountain runners? And I, I used to look at the best and think, well, are they any good at the track or the road? And do I need to still continue in track and road? And where do you, do you, 
did I as an athlete, but where do your athletes fit within that? What do you need to work at? If they're a, a really out and out fell and mountain, they're having good success, but maybe need to work on a bit more of the their, their leg speed in the winter months. Do you focus on some road and, and, and cross country there? And I think it's finding what strengths the athlete has and what they then need to become a more successful mountain runner. And is it a combination of everything or are they a real specialist where it's only going to be just the mountains for them? I found that for me, I was at my best where I, I maintained my leg speed. And I think from coaching Andy Davis over the years, we've always maintained that if he's, you know, done all the mountain training, but still in a good sort of 10 mile half marathon shape, he's been really successful in mountain races as well. In terms of, you know, finding information, there's not as much out there for mountain running. There's not as many papers, there's not as many coaching information, and it is still a niche sport that's growing. But once you're out on the, the continent, especially the Italians, the Austrians, the Czech athletes, they're, they're really good and open and willing to share what they do. And I was, as an athlete, I was always searching for information and I was not afraid to ask and, and challenge people and speak to different coaches. And I, I encourage you all, this is not just from a mountain running perspective, but across all sports, uh, all disciplines is, you know, copy, steal, beg, borrow, learn, and then apply it to your athletes. Because there's not one size, you know, fits all for, for endurance running. It's about finding out what will fit the individual athlete. And I, and I really think that there's lots of ideas, hopefully, that you've got from tonight's presentation that you can take away and apply. Really, I wouldn't encourage copying it because that's what worked for me. But taking in snippets of information and thinking, how can I then apply it? And so learning is something that I'm continuing to do all the time um, with my athletes. And it really is about looking outside the box and, and finding out as much as you possibly can. And then finally, I think for me, it was, I must have said it 10 times in tonight's presentation, it's planning and preparing. It really is important. If you want to be successful on the fells and the mountain, you really do have to plan and prepare. And I look back at my career, I was 31, 32, and I was only just starting to focus on um, mountain running and properly. And I think if I'd have gone back to maybe 24, 25, I may have had a lot more success. And um, yeah, it's a small regret, um, but I had a great time doing it. And I think for any athletes and coaches that are listening there, mountain running takes you to some of the most beautiful places in the UK and in Europe. And it really is all my fondest memories of um, competing athlete definitely come from my mountain races. So I really would encourage you to get out there and, and have a go. Or if you've got athletes that you think will fit the bill and be, become potentially a successful fellow mountain running, then really encourage them and, and support them in getting involved more. So I think um, there, Liz, I will just swap to the, to the main camera, hopefully. Um, and answer some of the questions that will be, uh, be coming through. Just bear with me. They're just starting to come through on my phone here. Okay, the first first question here that's come through, and I, I do encourage you. I, I aim for forty five minutes for the presentation. I didn't do bad there with uh, with forty four. So um, if, I would encourage you though to to put some questions through and and ask me uh, anything you want. And if there's anything that was uh, confusing or didn't come through there, just uh, please throw some through. So first question here was, what would be your advice for coaches of junior athletes who want to try mountain running? Well, I think I've sort of answered that question, but I think for mountain running, um, like I said, it's it's really just um, getting them involved and giving them a first taste. And yes, you don't need to do uh, a vast amount of preparation for the first one um, because it's something that you're just testing the water with, but uh, making sure that they're comfortable with going to the competition and excited about going to the competition um, and then doing the small amount of preparation based on where they're going to run and, and where that um, where that will be because I think um, I know that 
when I was uh, running, the mountain running was such a small thing as a junior athlete. I don't think I'd ever heard of it before. But um, I know that when I started to see juniors go to their first races, there were some juniors that turned up and, and I don't think the coach had really prepared them for what it was. And especially if you're from, you know, you're coming from the, the lowlands of the Cheshire, for example, and heard about this this great thing called mountain running, then you drive uh, an athlete and the parents out to um, Snowdon, for example, or Clamberis, and you're looking up at Mount Snowdon, it's a bit overwhelming. So I think the first one, just be careful, but I think um, it's an exciting thing to do. And if if your athlete is prepared and you've talked about the the the, the, the key things like pacing. I think the first mountain race you do, especially in uphill only, is about getting the pace right. Um, and then the up and downs, it's it's obviously making sure that uh, they don't come away with a bad experience where they, they can't walk for four or five days. But uh, I think that's inevitable with your first mountain race if, if you've not done one before. So yeah, I, 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 one thing for, for coaches out there, I would definitely recommend it for, for athletes that you think might fit the bill um, or for any athlete that's, that wants to get involved, then I could definitely try the, your best to, to give them the opportunity. And I know at, at Welsh Athletics, especially, there's information out there and there's, there's plenty of competitions out there um, from all the way through through Wales, from fell to mountain. So I think as a Welsh coach, there's plenty of opportunities, yeah. Okay, um, another question here. Um, what mountain races in the UK would you recommend targeting? Uh, well, at the moment, it's obviously difficult, but um, I think for, for me is the, the British Athletics mountain running um, circuit. There's, uh, I think, normally around about five across the, the, the summer season. Um, the uphill the uphill and the up and down alternate each year between Europeans and World Championships. Europeans are usually in July. And then the world's are normally September, October. And then you have the trial for each of them. So there's two races. And then you have the series um, across that. So the British Athletics Mountain Running Series. But I know that um, in terms of fell races that um, uh, are very similar, you can look at a lot of fell races throughout Wales and the Peak District, and up to Scotland, that replicate a lot of the um, type of terrain that you'll be running on in, in mountain races. And the key difference for those that don't know is that a lot of mountain races, especially on the continent, tend to follow a clearly marked trail path. Whereas Felrin, there's often parts of it where there's route choice from flags, etc. So mountain racing does differ on the continent where it's a lot more easily runnable, easily to see, and generally a lot safer uh, underfoot because you can you can see what you're running on. So yeah, that I think the, the best thing to do would Yes, in this difficult year with coronavirus, and there's not many opportunities, but normally the British Athletics Mountain Running Series has been something I've been uh, part of and um, really well organized races. Um, another question here from Eden O'Day, which is, what is your best holiday destination for mountain running? Um, I'd say Italy. Um, the Italians, I mean, I love Italy as a place. They have the best coffee in the world. They have the best ice cream in the world. And I think um, Northern Italy has so many options from the Dolomites right the way across to, to where I am in, in Samaritz at the moment, the Swiss Alps. And um, Switzerland's beautiful as well, but um, it's, it is expensive. Um, it's expensive to stay, but it's, it's worth coming to. But yeah, I would definitely recommend, um, yeah, I'd probably go, if I had to choose one, I'd say the Dolomites in, in Italy. Um, another question here from Gethin Powell. What specific strength and conditioning exercises do you recommend? Um, it's, it's really difficult without looking at an individual athlete to what, the, what they would need. But um, I, with my athletes, is strength conditioning, focusing on glute strength, which is the squat. Um, you can do a double leg squat or a single leg squat and deadlifts using a hex bar. Um, you don't need to go massive on weights at all. As long as you've got, um, a, you know, a, a safe area to lift and a good either physiotherapist to, that's uh, got a strength and conditioning background to help you and, and set a program. But yeah, the, the, the simple lifts in the single leg squat and the, and the double leg squat, normal squat. Um, but then a lot of what we do is, is glute activation exercises. So a lot of uh, single leg uh, Romanian deadlifts and, and single leg exercises like that. 
We use TheraBands quite a lot for, for doing different types of glute band walks, and they're really good at strengthening the glutes. In terms of calf raises um, for strengthening the calf, we use um, the Smith machine, which is basically a bar across your back um, that stays stationary in a machine that you can lift up. So they're really good for, for calf raises. Um, and then I think um, in terms of quad strength, I mean, anything uh, lifting in the gym really helps with, with quad strength. But I found that biking has been really beneficial to any mountain runner that, that I've worked with, um, you know, to, to get on a bike and, and do part of that. And it doesn't have to necessarily be outside. Um, quite a lot of uh, mountain runners do a couple of spin classes, for example, a week. And when you're doing fast reps on a really high gear, it, it really does help. So I think, yeah, strengthening and conditioning with, I can't give real specific exercises, but I'd always re recommend either seeking a strength con conditioning coach or speaking to a physiotherapist for some basic, um, basic advice there. So I think, Liz, that's all the questions there from everybody. Yeah, I think one, one just has come in from Eden again, so I will ask it to you. Okay. It's another, um, uh, another question about being abroad, but she said, what, what's your favorite post race treat or meal especially when you're abroad i think she's looking for oh gosh post you mentioned treat. the ice cream it already depends so it, depends how, it depends how hard i've run because um i like to have a drink after a big race i'm not a big drinker but i used to like a bit of um, a blowout but um if you've raced hard your stomach's sometimes a little bit so if i'm in italy it has to be a pizza normally it has to be a pizza and then uh the gelato the the ice cream is just unbelievable so it'd probably be pizza and ice cream but um, if my if I can stomach it, um, I love a really good steak. So um, a steak would often be a, a post race meal, and uh, yeah, but um, it's uh, it all depends where you are in in the world, I suppose, where the uh, the good food is. And uh, but yeah, my to answer two questions there to finish off with a nice pizza in, in a mountain race in Italy would be perfection. Good stuff, good stuff. Just a quick question from myself, actually, Steve. Um, just thinking about kind of people getting into mountain running and kind of those safety considerations and the planning required for being out in the mountains, that kind of thing. What would you recommend um, from that, that sort of side of things? So normally in, in the UK, for any mountain race that you enter or fell race, you will have um, a minimum requirement to take in case cloud cover com comes over and you potentially get lost. And that's normally a very simple bum bag and full body cover, which depending on the time of the year, it might just be a pair of thin waterproof trousers and a jacket. Some other races, hat and gloves will be required too. There's only one um, UK mountain race where I did have to actually wear that. Most of the time in the summer, it's been safe. Um, and it was just a really, really bad um, cloud cover and thick cloud cover towards the summit. But it's... Um, yeah, it's something that you all should be aware of and, and should all be taking to races. Most entry forms include that. And some fell races that are really long distance, you have to carry it no matter what, even if it's a beautiful day. Um, and I'd recommend it carrying it anyway, because if you're going to take on fuel on board, like gels or sweets or whatever that may be, I think it's really important to, to have that with you. And then if you're really adventurous, which I wasn't because I was terrible at navigating, is some of the races do require a map as well. And that's the the real fell races, but most, nearly all mountain races on the continent are marked um, the whole way. So, no, good good question there. Great, yeah, I think that wraps us up really. Um, fantastic, uh, Steve, uh, as usual. Thank you so much for your your insights. For for everybody who's watching, if you've missed any of the snippets, this will be going on the Welsh Athletics YouTube channel, so you'll be able to find sort of Steve's presentation and all the other webinars that have happened over the last few months there. But yeah, on behalf of Welsh Athletics, Steve, thank you so much for your time. And yeah, we hope to catch up with you soon. And again, thanks for everybody for joining. Okay, Brilliant. take care, everybody. Bye thank now. Thank you. Bye.